I want to say something about why I'm here this last two weeks. No, because that in monastic Buddhism, that even the Buddha, once he was fully enlightened, he made a vow. The Mao, this gentleman I already mentioned to you, tried to talk the Buddha into just not teaching anything. But just now you're enlightened, you can disappear. Because teaching people is a lot of pain. Organizing a monastery is really hard work. All the admin work and stuff. So they said, don't do that. Because people do it difficult to teach. And the Buddha said, no. He said, I will not enter Parinirvana and disappear from this world until, until I've established four communities. A community of fully ordained Buddhist monks who are enlightened. A community of fully ordained Buddhist nuns who are enlightened. A community of lay followers, men. A community of lay followers, women. When all those four communities are strong, so they can support one another. Now we support you in teachings and services, whatever we know we share. Now you support us in however you can help. Now we have rules for simplicity, renunciation, not, not having any money, not sort of keeping food. So we rely on you every day to feed us. You're doing very well with me, look at me. <laughs> not, no, you're not fat enough yet. You can't say that. So please look after her. And what you're doing is, well, once that was established in India, then the Buddha said, well, yes, I've done my job, I kept my promise. These four communities were very strong and powerful, so you could enter that environment. The monks' community has done strong for so many centuries. But the bhikkhunis, fully ordained Buddhist nuns, where are they? It's been very difficult to have bhikkhunis. It's allowed. I know my rules of discipline. That's why other people object to bhikkhunis. They never argue with me. I know my stuff. So, it's allowable. There aren't enough bhikkhunis yet. I did a bhikkhuni ordination in Australia 13 years ago. Okay, thank you. That is legitimate, it's growing, but not here in the UK. That's one of the reasons. This was where I was born. I was born in Park Royal Hospi Hospital in London. I grew up here. So that connection is still very strong here. And I told many people that after the bikini ordination, I forget exactly where, but one woman came up to me and said, things are very dark for women here in England. I remember that, I can't forget it. So when somebody says that to me, if I can, I do whatever I can to create that equity. There's equity in so many different parts of our world. Why not in Buddhism? What's wrong with having 40 ordained Buddhist nuns? And so basically, to me it's intolerable that we have that unfairness. So that's why I've been coming so many years trying to do something about it. That's why I ask you to help. That's why I ask you that in your lifetime, in my lifetime, we can have flourishing Buddhist monasteries for women as well as men. And I know, from, you, know you may think I'm wise, but I know there are some things which a bhikkhuni can teach which I will never be able to teach which I don't know. And so that's one of the reasons why it's imperative to have sort of that equity in our Buddhist tradition. That's why I ask you to please support Bhikkhuni Chanda. How to support her? 
is just instead of just uh, saying, oh, how can I help? And then telling her all your problems, there's only one of her, and how many of you? After a while, she gets burnt out. So please see how you can volunteer to help in this way and that way. Especially to feel that there's a community here in UK supporting her. There's people she can turn to just for food for the day. Now it is allowable in times of emergency for monks and nuns to cook their own food. But that's not the real thing, that's only emergency. So if you can find a time to actually to offer her a meal, find out exactly what she needs, because you can't take any garlic, because I can't take any chilli in my food. So you know, sometimes you take some and you get a very sore, sore stomach afterwards. So find out what she needs, and if you can find a way of offering it, even just spending a day down in Oxford where she is right now, it's not that far from Bristol. And then you can offer some food, find out what she wants, give you a blessing. And I know you'd love to spend more time down there, but please don't spend too much time. Otherwise, for her, the food costs many hours of her time giving counselling and being friendly to you. She's a very friendly nun, but being too friendly, you get burnt out. And in the future, that's supporting bhikkhuni chanting. How many bhikkhunis, all your day, Theravada Buddhist nuns, are there in UK? In the whole of UK? How many? One. Right in front of you. That's the burden she takes. And I don't know if she can. She's a fragile plant, as I said last night. So care for her, otherwise they can very easily just run away because it's too much hard work. Not really running away, just be looking after herself. <laughs> so be caring, be careful. I just want to let you know that. And we only have this hall for another seven minutes. Okay, you want to say something? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So don't talk too much because uh, afterwards we have to vacate the hall. Other, oh no, no, please stay a long time and I can go to jail. <laughs> there we go. Thanks. I just want to thank Ajahn Hirshini, first of all, for your amazing support for all monastics, but also for taking yeah. that really brave and courageous, heartfelt ethical step to ordain or to facilitate the ordination of women, because this is so important for the strength of Buddhism everywhere and also for supporting me. And by supporting me, it's not, it doesn't mean it's about me. I want to really make that clear. You may be coming to feed me now because I'm the only bhikkhuni, but the whole point is that this is for the Sangha to grow. So it's not about an individual. It's not about Adrian Brown. It's not about me. It's about starting community for everybody. Because among you now, I don't know if there's anybody with the remotest of monastic aspirations. There are some children, who knows? <laughs> but in the future, there will be women. And for women who don't see that possibility, then of course the aspiration cannot grow. But when there is a possibility, and when women are represented in the monastic form as well, then they can maybe see a path forward to develop in the monastic training way. And so this is really for the sake of the preservation and strength of Buddhism and to give more opportunities, not just to women, but to all people, especially people who feel more marginalized. One of the things I'm really proud about in this project is that I feel it attracts a greater diversity of people, um, different races, different colors, different genders, different age groups, and especially people who do feel marginalized, I think, certainly women. And, for myself as a bikini now, I've actually never felt so marginalized ever before. <laughs> because it's sad to say this in a religion like Buddhism, but there's still a heap of discrimination. Every day I hear about it, you know, every day I hear about a friend of mine who easily found a place to meditate in the forest and there's all these huts there for them to go to and I know I can't go to that place. This is like a daily thing for me that I hear this disparity. And so 
Uh, Jen gave me the opportunity, being a teacher that I'm very close to and have 100% trust in, to come over here and try to start something. And it is hard work. And I'm, I don't know if I use the word fragile. Certainly everybody in life is fragile. We're all human beings. We have our limits. I've worked very, very hard to start this. You know, it's been seven years and we've organized seven tours for Adrian Brown, mainly myself and one bookings volunteer. Now the community is growing and it's wonderful and we do lots of online teaching and things are getting a bit easier in that respect. And this year I was in Perth. I had the amazing opportunity to spend nearly eight months in your monastery, Adrian, where I feel I belong. And I'm, I'm a part of the community, but only ever as a visitor, being female. So, but I had a long retreat period there. And during that time, we actually purchased the first property owned by us. So we now have a small vihara, it's like a monastery, but a small one, in Oxford. So I just want to say that we've achieved a lot and we actually have a base now. So it's the beginnings, you know, even though there's been seven years leading to this, it's actually the beginnings of something concrete, so we have a place to meet, and uh, of course, for you to come, offer dana if you can, or come and meditate, just come and spend some time, spend a week, or even longer, living in this place with me, and start to be part of this community, because that's what it's all about, and hopefully in that way, we can offer another place of safety and sanctuary and a place for developing your practice, because that's what it's really all about. Right? It's all about helping us to develop on the path of Buddhism, on the path of peace. So I'm hoping this can be not only a lot of work for me, but a gift of peace to many people, both now and in time to come. So it's a long-term project. You know, It might be several generations before we have like several nuns, but I feel it's worth planting that seed because if somebody doesn't do this, nothing's going to happen, nothing's going to change. So yeah, it takes, you know, a strong person like Adrian Brown to actually be an ally for bhikkhunis, but yeah, we also have to uh, pull together and um, yeah, honour that in a sense. And since it is the last talk, I just want to thank you, Ajahn, from the depths of my heart for coming to England and offering your wisdom and kindness and compassion through so many teachings. We did an online retreat and we've done many teachings all over, actually, not all over England, but next yeah. year we'll do a little bit more. And uh, just for your commitment, you know, through thick and thin to this project for the sake of all beings. And also, I always get the applause, but now I think a nice round of applause for Venerable Chanda as well. She takes the hardest of all.